Puerto Rican Voices is brought to you by the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, with the generous support of the New York City Council and Hunter College of the City University of New York. My name is Edwin Melendez. I'm the director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. Today we're talking about the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and its effects in the agricultural sector in Puerto Rico. Over 80% of the food is imported to Puerto Rico. The agricultural sector was one of the most affected by Hurricane Maria. 80% of the crops were lost. Here to talk more about this sector and its importance to Puerto Rico and the impact of the Hurricane Maria, we have today with us Dr. Ramon Borges Mendez. He is a planner by training. He has been in Puerto Rico frequently. We'd like to welcome him to uh, the show. Saludos, Ramon. Tal? Thank you so much for being here with us. Ramon, I would like to introduce the next segment by asking you a few questions about the effects of the hurricane in the industry, and what can you tell us about your impressions as you have visited Puerto Rico? The impact was very direct, but also a series of very important indirect effects. Direct effects destroyed what already was a very weakened sector in terms of having destroyed crops, having destroyed infrastructure, roads, and machinery. Second, accelerated the depopulation of the region with very important secondary or, or indirect effects such as, you know, breakdown of households, um, inavailability of work, uh, and simply there are no people to, to work in the region. And, and, and I think finally there has been a profound environmental uh, impact that has taken place as the hurricane really destroyed the forest, uh, destroyed other um, aspects of, of the natural resource base of the region, which are fundamental for coffee to grow. Also, can you talk a little bit about the impact of the environment as it affects the agricultural sector? The impact on the environment um, by Maria uh, comes by way of various channels. But first, the forest in Puerto Rico has suffered greatly, and it takes many years for forests to sort of grow back. Uh, the second, it Im impacted uh, bird populations and also uh, very important aspects about, you know, the process of pollinization. Uh, because insects have been completely depleted, um, as well as, as birds, as I mentioned. Um, also, it, it, changed, uh, it changed temperature, because when the trees are destroyed, temperature tends to be sort of also um, affected, and that affects uh, the ecosystemic components that are part of, you know, of, of, the, of the coffee region and agricultural production in the central part. Ramon, can you also talk a little bit about the impact of the hurricane on the infrastructure of the area to sustain agricultural production? You know, you have to understand that coffee, especially, um, you need a, a series of, 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 coffee goes through a series of stages. So you don't only pick the coffee, then you have to process the coffee, you have to aggregate the coffee, then you have to roast the coffee, you have to transport it to a, a variety of places. So the roads were heavily affected in the region. Machinery, which was already old, is, you know, basically stopped. Um, electricity, which is fundamental to grow the roasting equipment and other kind of machinery, was, was not available. So, um, so the impact uh, not only affected the natural component, but also affected the infrastructure that um, is heavily and very important for the purpose of you know, um, coffee production and other um, you know, um, agriculture production. We have some interviews from coffee growers producers in Puerto Rico. So let's watch a little bit of what they say uh, about the crisis in agriculture. And can you and I talk on the other side to discuss? Let's take a look. Y aquí estamos. 
en lo más que yo amo, la tierra. Aquí estamos a 3.000 pies, el huracán nos dio por todos lados. Obviamente aquí estamos expuestos tanto para el mar Atlántico como para el mar Caribe. Y esto quedó totalmente devastado, tuvimos que renovarla. Estamos nuevamente con más ánimo que nunca, no hay marcha atrás. Para que este arbolito llegara a este tamaño, primero obviamente que llevar el vivero, el minar el granito, se trasplanta y aquí aproximadamente esto tiene de 10 meses a un año. Comenzaremos a ver café en Puerto Rico comercialmente, digamos, para abastecer el consumo en el 2024. Por eso es que estamos en la peor crisis de la industria del café. La agricultura en Puerto Rico y la agricultura en el mundo debe ser la empresa más importante, es la que sufre los años. Actualmente quedábamos antes de María aproximadamente 4.000 caficultores, producíamos entre 15 a 20.000 empleos directos e indirectos. La industria de café está enclavada en los 21 municipios de la región central en Puerto Rico y prácticamente lo que mueve esta región, lo que crea actividad económica, lo que crea desarrollo social es la industria de café. Por eso cuando hablamos de café, pensemos realmente en cuánto aporta al desarrollo social a un sector en específico. Yo diría que el 90% del café del consumo de 250.000 es importado. ¿Pero por qué sucede eso? Si tenemos un consumo de 250.000 y este año tuvimos una cosecha de 20.000 quintales, por lo tanto, de alguna manera tenemos que suplir la demanda. Ese café viene de las importaciones, puede ser de México, puede ser de República Dominicana, de la persona que se lleva la subasta. ¿Cómo nosotros podemos evitar eso? Obviamente invirtiendo en la industria del café, dándonos semillas, ayudándonos con abonos, ayudándonos con distintos incentivos, ayudándonos a, a que el empleado agrícola tenga una mejor paga. Somos un grupo de mujeres, todas eh, con nuestras profesiones, pero con un, algo en común que es la agricultura. Y nos hemos unido eh, para poder eh, hacer el proyecto Bucarabón. El proyecto Bucarabón es un proyecto social que busca eh, hacer que la comunidad comience a crecer económicamente nuevamente. Nosotros queremos revitalizar la finca y volver a traer proyectos tanto agroecológicos como de agricultura regular. bien importante motivar a las personas, es bien importante educar a las personas. Muchas personas en esta comunidad, así como en las comunidades aledañas, no tienen la información necesaria para poder sembrar. Muchas personas están dependiendo de programas del gobierno y lo que necesitamos es que comiencen a ser más eh, independientes de esos programas y comiencen a ser empresarios. Otra cosa bien importante es eh, promover la agricultura ecológica. Eso es algo que en Puerto Rico está surgiendo nuevamente y necesitamos apoyar ese tipo de agricultura. ¿Por qué? Porque aquí en este centro también nosotros queremos hacer eh, lo que se llama actualmente un farm to table, que es llevar el producto de la finca a la mesa, que la gente comience a diferenciar lo que es el producto hecho eh, aquí versus el, el de afuera, que comience a educarse en ese sentido de comida. Coming up next at Puerto Rican Voices. The first story that I heard from my grandmother's lips, Teresa Martina has been my golden key in opening doors for me everywhere. It is just a fundamentally unique experience to read about characters that you can identify with. If you just read what she published, you would only have a fraction of a very skewed view of what she was writing. Thank goodness we have her archives here. Welcome back to Puerto Rican Voices. Ramon, can you comment on what uh, uh, Chris and Jacqueline have said about the impact of the hurricane on coffee production? The, the impact clearly shows that we're going to need to make significant investments to bring it back, right? Because um, that, you know, coffee is, is it requires, you know, it requires technology. You know, the island has been you know, quite behind in terms of 
um, technological you know production and um, the capacity to you know invest in science and technology to grow new coffee varieties. Uh, there is no strategy for including the local producers. There are sort of quick fix solutions that seek to you know plant the region with cheap coffee. Uh, the local producers who have been there for you know some of them you know over a hundred years uh, need need attention. Uh, there needs to be a regional perspective because most of those solutions take up on a regional character. And finally, there needs to be um, capacity to also involve the municipalities in the process of economic development. Uh, this cannot just simply come from the central government, and there needs to be local capacity, and that needs to be grounded in the region. That extension of agricultural infrastructure, which was already obsolete, now is practically inexistent. Uh, obviously, uh, the agricultural industry is not just coffee. There are many other components. We interview some of the producers that are trying to develop agro-tourism and production of agriculture that is linked to other sectors in the economy. So we are going to interview a few people related to the Visit Rico, which is a group of farmers that are actually promoting ecotourism. So please stay with us and we will com comment on that on the other end. After Maria, we, we first started with phase one, which was to get funds, direct economic funds for farmers to know that they, they could have some money to s continue their work. They can start off again and not leave the country. We needed farmers at the farms to continue um, supporting our agriculture and our, protecting our patrimony. Agritourism is um, a way of uh, ecological tourism, ecotourism but it gives people the opportunity to visit the place where the farmers work, where the food comes from, how is it produced, stories behind our culture, gastronomy, and meeting a farmer, meeting the farmers who are the ones that bring food to our table, hopefully, because of course in Puerto Rico we import 85% of the food, and that is something we want to break. We want people to see face to face the people who produce food in Puerto Rico. We had help from a lot of volunteers that came to Colaboratorio and they're actually still on our team. They, they have been great. Uh, they came at the perfect time. We got farm aid to support us. So that was the first big connection we got. We raised over $490,500. It went directly to the farmers. It was over 40 farmers that received this fund from them. Coming up next at Puerto Rican Voices. The fact that we have a center for Puerto Rican studies is something that you can't get anywhere else. I'd say it's probably the most important research resource for anyone learning about the diaspora. People who are passionate about our history and culture can go and learn more about who we are. Centro pinpoints and expresses what Puerto Ricans are all about, what their history is all about, their culture. As a journalist, it's very useful because it provides well-researched statistics of our communities throughout the United States. And the journal is unique in that it is the only journal that publishes research articles on the Puerto Rican experience. You can find old records, you can find old photographs, you can even find old puppets from the Pura Belpre archives. It holds our history and protects it. And without Centro, without the archives, without the library, all these materials would be in jeopardy. Welcome back to Puerto Rican Voices. Ramon, what I would like to talk uh, about now is what can we do for the agricultural sector? Do you have any reactions to the Visit Rico and ecotourism presentation that we just heard? Agriculture um, has been not maximized as a very important resource in Puerto Rico for many years. Yet we can achieve a great deal by improving three things. Number one, the connectivity between the actors and the people who participate in the sector. And I think that's critical, for example, for the farm to table movement, uh, for the creation of organic markets, for the creation of a variety of other venues in which the local agriculture can be an important input. Um, number two, um, the fact that in agriculture, 
uh, especially in the island, we're talking about small agriculture at this point, it's very unlikely that people will have available employment all year long. So a good part of making agriculture a viable sector is also connecting it to other sectors, such as tourism, uh, such as education, uh, such as conservation. And those are, um, uh, you know, those are sectors that can also generate income for people you know, in those regions. So at the very end, what you do is create um, steady income, not necessarily steady employment. Right. But that should be good enough to you know, improve the development of many regions in the region. We also have interviewed an organization called Finca La Ceiba. They promote ecotourism and agrotourism as well. Let's take a look. La Finca se desarrolla con, a nivel agroecológico se desarrolla con los principios de permacultura, que son los principios de observación y de desarrollo de fases, considerando los valores de la naturaleza, ¿verdad? los elementos, considerando lo que la, el agua, el fuego, el viento, la tierra, los elementos básicos, el aire. Y entonces a través de la observación de los espacios vamos definiendo qué cosas se van a ir desarrollando poco a poco. Comenzamos con la casa, con el área del trailer, que es la cocina donde está el fuego de la familia y de ahí empezamos a expandir poco a poco las áreas para poder desarrollar las necesidades de las, las personas que estaban aquí. Vici Rico nos contactó y hizo, nos hizo unas preguntas claves, ¿verdad? En ese momento estábamos tan en shock que no sabíamos ni qué necesitábamos. Nos trajeron eh, como magnífica aportación herramientas claves que son sumamente costosas y que en ese momento de caos ni siquiera se conseguían en el país. Esto es un bosque de alimentos. Se llama Food Forestry. La ayuda de Bicitico fue crucial. Lo que nos hubiese tomado seis meses nos tomó dos días. Y gracias a la ayuda, las herramientas, los fondos y todo el amor que trajo, trajeron estas personas a la finca, nos dio la, los primeros pasitos y los, para levantar otra vez estos pininos y volver a coger ese empuje, esa inspiración y, y echar para adelante un poquito. Así que estamos sumamente agradecidos de lo que han hecho, no solo con nosotros, sino con montones de otras fincas que sabemos que son hermanos, que sabemos que también estaban en situaciones iguales o peores que nosotros. Y esperamos que las relaciones sigan y que la gente siga colaborando de una forma u otra. La lección para mí más importante, les repito, fue esa, esa, ese reactivarnos de esperanza, de yo ver un pueblo capaz de defenderse a sí mismo, de, capaz de rehacerse a sí mismo. ¿Qué es lo que me repiten constantemente los agricultores? Ustedes fueron los primeros. Ustedes fueron los que nos dieron la ayuda. Sin ustedes yo no hubiera podido volver a sembrar. Sin ustedes no hubiéramos tenido semilla. Nos mandaron semilla de la diáspora, con esa semilla fue que se sembró. Y a todos les decíamos lo que nos decían ellos mismos. Hay que sembrar cosas verdes rápidas para poderlas vender en el mercado. Bicirrico reactivó esos mercados agrícolas que eran importantísimos. Porque eran punto de encuentro, pero además de eso, el verse unos a otros, el poderse hablar el saber que se podían reactivar. Además, descubrimos que la, agro, la agroecología realmente es más fuerte, <ríe> realmente sobrevive mejor una serie de cataclismos, el, la tierra colabora y es mucho más fuerte y produce mucho más después. Esas fueron las mejores lecciones que tuvimos. Sin esa ayuda de las comunidades extranjeras, esto hubiese sido mucho más difícil. Esto no se ha acabado. Primero que nada, vivimos en una isla donde ya nos han pronosticado que esto va a seguir ocurriendo y tenemos que prepararnos. Y cosas tan sencillas como agua, eh, sistemas de ancar pozo, de hincar pozo, de, de poder compartir estas aguas limpias que tenemos con la comunidad, eh, para mí serían cosas como cruciales de, de, de necesidades inmediatas. Sería súper chévere accesar y, y poder eh, lograr que sea para el beneficio de una comunidad y de, y, de las, y de las familias aledañas a estas comunidades. Tenemos que hacernos conscientes de que en este país tan abundante y tan bendito, con tanta tierra tan fértil, que uno tira una semillita y a los meses estás comiendo. Hacernos conscientes de, de esas bendiciones y aprovecharlas y compartirlas. Es una buena forma de, de ver, primero, que podemos alimentarnos de la tierra nosotros, compartir este alimento y tener buena salud. Coming up next at Puerto Rican Voices. 
I'm a Rican. He find me my own way, my own way, anyway. He was a wordsman. He also taught us a lot about the meaning and the power of words and writing. The living room and kitchen of many desperate souls, Tumbao Street Gutted Movement. Tato is indeed one of the most important uh, New Yorkian poets, but he's also a major poet. He truly captured the essence of so many people who walk the streets of New York that no one sees and no one listens to and no one knows. Give us your tire, your beating, your triste, but I you write your obituary with the days of your life. Tato has written his legacy with the poetry in his life. Don't single me out, touch all our people, touch all our people, and maybe then, and maybe then you can touch me. Welcome back to Puerto Rican Voices. Ramon, now that we have examined these case studies, what can you tell us about what is needed in the agricultural sector to support these farmers recover from the impact of the hurricanes? Number one, we need to recompose the agricultural extension system, which has never been you know, um, very powerful, but you know, continues to have uh, models of connecting to the farmer that are not fast enough, are exceedingly bureaucratic, and are not bringing those farmers the connectivity and the science and technology they need. Um, number two, we need um, strategies that are inclusive of multiple sectors within the agricultural section sector. Um, um, sort of bringing the new generation that is interested in the farms, uh, people who are you know, connected to the land uh, from sort of the old, you know, the old days, but there's a, you know, a, a good number of, of new incomers that, that need to, you know, that are interested in and that are, have very different views, have a very different set of skills. Uh, they can take advantage of those skills and, and the opportunities. And I think we need to, we need to support them. We need to give them science and technology. We need to give them investment. And we need to remove a great deal of, you know, bureaucratic red tape that is not allowing those youngsters to move ahead. Did you see any organization from the diaspora helping these organizations or farmers directly to support their situation in, uh, in produ production of agriculture? Yes. We, we met a number of those organizations. You have a variety of, you know, co-ops that have been formed. Um, the, uh, the League of Cooperatives of Puerto Rico has been supporting them. Uh, you know, they have uh, a unit that is beginning to give attention to those emerging small businesses. Uh, we have independent small farmers that are trying to find opportunity, trying to understand how can they improve their business. Um, uh, also, the cost, the, you know, the consumer has also been very important that they are demanding uh, products that can be grown locally and are willing to pay the premium for that. Um, the universities are helping indirectly uh, a great deal, but uh, that effort needs to be more concerted, more directed, and more focused. Looking at the future, do you think that, our, that agriculture can go back uh, on track of becoming one of the anchors of the Puerto Rican economy, especially in the current uh, conditions that, where we import more than 80% of what we eat? Well, the, the, my involvement um, in Puerto Rico has to deal with the work that the Center for Puerto Rican Studies has been doing in gathering people and beginning to motivate people to go back to Puerto Rico and make those connections. Um, there is a variety of you know, smaller foundations uh, that also have been um, active in financing, you know, at least providing seed grants for people to be able to spend a little time and connect with the actors. Uh, and most interesting, I've also received, as part of, of the work that I have been doing, a lot of requests from professionals, independent professionals, who might not necessarily have the money but have the skill and would be willing to continue engaging with those smaller organizations for the purposes of growing bigger projects. Um, and so, so I think it's about fo promo promoting that connectivity. Uh, some of it can lead to bigger projects, but I think the smaller projects can lead to bigger things if you continue at least to nurture that cumulative process. In the context that we have discussed, what can you conclude about this episode? Especially, what do you think is the role of social entrepreneurship in supporting agricultural development? Social entrepreneurship in agriculture is fundamental. Ultimately, you need to generate revenue, and you need people to feel motivated 
you know, by seeing the fruits of their labor, you know, accrue. And, and so we need to support those, you know, those initiatives. Uh, however, we also need not to just be too romantic about it. We really need to make people understand that agriculture is hard work. And, and, and I think, you know, once people understand that there are local opportunities, that is hard work, and that there are ways in which you can maximize your effort, uh, by connecting to a variety of resources that are available but that we have not used effectively, I think we might be able to just use agriculture and see the future of agriculture in very different terms that we've seen in the past. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramon Borges Mendez, for being with us uh, today. We really appreciate the work that you are doing in Puerto Rico. We really appreciate your expertise and we thank you for guiding us through the agricultural sector and what we need to do to rebuild Puerto Rico. <music>